Okay, we're pinned. Well, everybody, thanks for joining. This is uh, this is Jason Beatty and Leong Ma, and we're here talking about Leong Ma design knives. Leong, thanks for joining. Hey, thank you for having me here. I I'm glad it. we could do this. Yeah, it just occurred to me I, I didn't change the logo at the top of the screen. I should have changed it to your logo. Oh well. Oh. Too late now. Can't look back. <laughs> <laughs> So I've known Leong for several years, and um, I've owned your knives for several years now. And I first came across your designs through our friend Tom Moore, um, who was, I believe, the first to land one of your knives, at least in my circles. And um, I remember he just would not stop telling me about how good they were and how nice they were and how nice they felt in his hand and just how functional they were to him. And uh, then I remember meeting you at Blade Show and I uh, got to sample more of your work, and I was really impressed. So. Uh, I've been a fan for a few years, and I'm excited to be able to talk to you today. Thank you, thank you, and and yeah, Tom. Um, you know, and speaking with Tom, he mentioned that he met me earlier than when you and him came up to my booth uh, a couple of times a, a couple of years ago at Blade Show, and he was like, "Yeah, I met you early. Do you remember?" I'm like, "I'm sorry, I don't." But I'm like so glad that you know you actually took the time to to come up and and handle my knives because that's always like. You know you you gave me a chance and so i always appreciate when someone gave me a chance and actually feel the knives and actually like you know they may not tell me what they think at the time but later on they tell they come back and they tell me and and you know i receive like really good responses and really good uh feedback from people and i really take that to heart because like i put a lot of uh, time and effort into how a handle and how my knife feels overall in someone's hand you know I'm I've noticed sometimes, especially in creative endeavors, you can really put a thousand hours into something and you, you get tunnel vision where you're certain that this is going to resonate. And then when you touch it, your, your customers and your, your customers can experience the product that you've designed. Sometimes the, the feedback you get is, is, can be surprising, right? It's just not exactly what you anticipated because in yeah. your head, you've kind of worked it up. Is that true? Yeah. 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 And, and sometimes, you know, you, I spend so much time on it that sometimes I'm like, oh my God. I can't believe I spent so much time on this, but it's like the 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 goal is is to really like wow somebody or to really like when someone gives me a shot and they're like, hey, you know what? I kind of I kind of realize now why people like his stuff, you know? Because we live in an age, and I bring this point up multiple times. We live in an age where we have really great products from Absolutely. everybody, right? Yeah. And everybody's bringing their A game to the to the to the table, so it's like, okay, what what is gonna separate me from someone else? What is gonna be how 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 someone gonna recognize my stuff? And why would they? Because there's so many nice that are very similar in the on the market right now. So a lot of things are in the details, you know. And so um, as like a, a knife user like like you. Am I always willing to pay for the details? Am I always willing to, to go shop for them and go hunt for them? And there are people who are. And there are people who are like, no, oh, no, I just want this beater, you know? But the ones who are real enthusiasts, that's why I'm here. Yeah, yeah I've noticed with your knives, I'll, I'll really look at them close like analyze the details of of the the features and the and the options that you build into them and i'll go oh this is an upgrade and this is an upgrade and i know that's an upgrade and this is not standard and this is an upgrade and by the time you total them all up and you look at the knife and go wow this is really a, a premium knife in most cases even your simpler designs you're not skipping on the little things and i, I have a feeling that's because you're you're appealing to that discriminant buyer is that true yeah yeah, and, and that's one of the reasons, uh, like, you know, I did, like, I do a lot of limited edition. Like, so right. let's say, take, for example, uh, the Warrior 2, right? And um, usually I just do runs of, like, 200 pieces. But inside those 200 pieces, I may have four to five different handle skews and even also blade uh, finishes. And with the GSD, we were able to, bring out even more skews and some of them instead of like 40 pieces or 50 pieces it was only 15 right and it was just like does this really make sense i'm like you know what i i don't want to like go do so many of this so the i've been very fortunate 
to be able to, to do things and on a much smaller skew level. And for some things, it doesn't make sense. Like, you know, there are people who really like Stonewash Titanium, right? And I do too. So for that, I'll probably do like 85 to 100 pieces. And that's fine because that, that's, that will actually have some market to sell it. But for some of the other ones where it's like hand rope satin finish, not everybody wants the hand rope satin finish. Not everybody wants like the latest uh, fat carbon or, or even pay the premium for it, you know? So for that, you know, I kind of am, I'm glad that I don't have to charge the premium for that and just get right. like, people just want like the, you know, the, the, the really good knife. There's mm -hmm. still premium ingredients, but it's not polished to the end. One example of a premium ingredient that on the top of my head is is the, the texture that you put on the titanium. So yeah. stonewash tie is extremely common in the market. Um, a blasted tie is also popular. And what stonewashed and blasted both have in common is they're they're not super durable. Like we see a lot of snail trail comments on secondhand knives in the market. You know, guys will ask, how do I get rid of a snail trail? It's like, oh, you need a blasting cabinet and the exact same kind of blasting material that they use the first time. That's the answer. Um, whereas your your texturized titanium, it's a it's a brushed yeah. finish. Isn't that true? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, 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 like on the few duties that you have, you and Tom have, mm -hmm. I like to uh, do that orange peen, which is uh, they do it with a wire wheel. And what that does is it really, it hits the titanium with like all these thousands of wires, right? It's a right. spinning wheel and it's creating like this, this, this hardened side on the, on the titanium. Mm -hmm. And so you could put it in your pocket and, you know, it's, it's going to be harder to scratch than all the other titanium surfaces, you know, because it's already super scratched up to a point where it's evenly uh, surface that way. And that's actually one of my uh, favorite finishes. Now that same titanium will not anodize. Right. Because we're putting so much steel on top of the titanium that there's actually a layer of steel um, oxide onto the titanium. So in order to anodize that, we had to polish that wire wheel off to be able to anodize that uh, titanium again. Yeah, there's a property in titanium. It's called. It's sometimes known as work hardening, mm -hmm. where when you when you rub it, or in this case wire wheel it, it actually makes the titanium harder, not softer. Whereas blasting will make it softer, not harder, because it becomes porous. Yeah. So what happens on this wire wheel texture is that it's it's actually more scratch resistant because the hardness is increased. So it's a really good choice, and it's something that probably isn't cheap. Um, I know some people will refer to it as orange peel, which is generally a pejorative. It's not a compliment, but that's it does resemble that texture a little bit. And to for those yeah. who, are, who are watching, it, that's kind of the idea is that it's a it's texturized like an orange peel or a like it looks like it has pores in it. Yep. But ultimately, what's happened is is I've carried this knife a fair amount, and I don't have any scratches. I don't have any marks in it at all despite, you know, having keys in my pocket or wedding bands or, or whatever, watch, watch bands bumping up against my, my knife. It doesn't scratch. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in, you know, in all the years I've been doing it, that is probably the most durable of all the titanium finishes. And it takes time because when, when the titanium contacts the wheel, it, it makes it hot. Right. <laughs> so it's like, Whoever they're doing it, they probably fasten it onto like a, a working block, so they're not they're not physically holding the titanium. But I've seen them hold like the clips and the backspace, so because you know the fastest way to do it is to pick it up and rub it up against the wheel. But after if they if they keep holding onto the same spot, it will get hot. Really absolutely, hot. yeah, absolutely. I wanted to ask you about a little bit about your origin in the knife making world. I know you haven't always been a knife designer, but um, why don't, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got into this? So I was always fascinated with knives. You know, um, when I was a kid, uh, my uncle would co uh, collect rifles. Mm -hmm. And back in those days, whenever he bought a new rifle, they would give him like a buck knife. And he would just hand it to me. And looking at those knives now, and, you know, I would always look for ways to improve the, 
the handle of improve how the grip was in your hand. And I just started drawing and I kept drawing and I kept drawing. Well, one day it was just like, yeah, it would be so great if someone made my knife. So I, I, I actually started reading books and there, there are several books I've read, uh, including Bob Perzola's book. Uh, there's another book, uh, How to Build uh, Folding Knives. And after looking and reading those books, I threw out all my drawings because none of them would have worked, right? And I went into stenciling and I stencil all the designs and then I would cut up, cut up pieces of paper and put them onto like plastic sheets, like really thin plastic sheets that you can use an exacto knife and just cut it out and right. then bend it. And with those exacto sheets, uh, then I was I put a spot where the, the pivot would be the, the stop pin and the opening mechanism. And it got me closer and closer to where I wanted to go with a, with a knife design. You know, it was still very, very prehistoric because if you want to change the line, you kind of have to like erase and leave a mark and all this right. other stuff. Right. Um, and after a few of those and, you know, just going to knife shows and discovering that people actually made knives for a living, which was like mind blown at the time, right? It was like, people actually do this for a living? You know, because I always thought like a factory made knives, right? But people actually can craft knives. So I, I would approach them and talk to them about their knives. And after building up a relationship with them and, you know, asking them, like, would they build my design? Now, right. when you ask someone that, there's going to be two thoughts. One of them is going to be like, okay, he probably wants this design of mine, but maybe change the blade a little. Or there's no way he has anything that I have never thought of before, right? So I would go there with like a, this, these plastic cutouts and my, and my stencil drawings, and they're like, wow, okay. Okay, this is different. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, and then eventually, like as I gained more traction in like asking more and more people to produce my knives and then, you know, knife makers are a small group, so they'll ask you sort of how is it to work with him? How is this? To... And they were like, hey, the strongs are good, you know? Um, and I'm not saying like I've never had any failures in that. I've had failures and I just sure. keep going forward. Yeah. So with that, it kind of got me like like a reputation like, hey, you can work with this guy and you could, and his drawings are good, you know? So that allowed me to get more prototypes built and then initial runs. And back then I used to do a run. What, what year was this, by the way? Ooh, 94. 94. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it was just, you know, Eddie Baca was one of the first makers I've worked with. He's from mm -hmm. New Mexico. And I knew him before his son was born. And now his son has finished college and is working for Wicked Edge. <laughs> oh, wow. You know, so it's like some of these relationships really go back. That's funny. Yeah. And, and it's like, you know, and he still builds everything by hand. Still builds everything, still cuts everything out by hand. And it's just like amazing. Like, you know, like the precision on some of his knives are amazing. You know, so as I wanted to push the envelope more, I, I got a copy of CAD. And, you know, I, it took me about six months to kind of learn some of the basics on CAD and to actually like be patient enough because you're going to sit down and you're going to open it up and just to draw a few lines and then erase it. Frustration is really easy to, to, to set in. Okay. And so you got to be patient and then you got to come yeah. back, you got to close the program out, come back when you are like, okay, I'm more patient now. And then with that, I, I, I drew like uh, about 10 drawings. And then I found out that Eddie Baca's wife was an AutoCAD engineer. She's an architect. Um, and I asked if, uh, if it would be okay for her to look over my drawings to see if they're okay. And then she told me, Leon, no one can ever handle your knives. Your handles are five feet long and your blades are four feet long. It's too big for any humans to handle them. Oh no, you had the scaling <laughs> wrong. And I was just like, I was laughing my butt off when she told me that. That's funny. 
And so it got, but you know, it, it was awesome because it was like, okay, I made mistakes and, and now I get to learn from them. And then right. other, other makers were also AutoCAD engineers like Larry Davidson. Uh, he was the first one who did 3D texturing on G10 and and every and then eventually now on titanium. But he was the first one to do all those uh, 1911 grips with 3D mm -hmm. texturing. Mm -hmm. So he also like I approached him to look at my drawings and, and he gave me pointers and everything. And so it's like it's like there's been a lot of people who gave me pointers and helped me along the way. And I really appreciate all the free knowledge that everybody has been giving me. Yeah. You know? And they're willing to help me, you know? So like whenever someone comes up to me and asks me about like, um, like making, pr producing knives in China, I'm going to advise them, you know, because other people have helped me in the past. Right. You know? And this is just a way to pay it forward. You know, there's, there's been a lot of guys who ask me like what to do and who to talk to, but, Nowadays, it's, it's sort of like the best time to be a knife designer. Like, yeah, there are people who told me they just made a sketch on a napkin and gave it to a company and they produced it. I'm like, that has never happened to me in my life. <laughs> I have noticed overall there are there are some outliers that don't want to help. But for the most part, I'm finding that there's a, the, the community is very embracing of new people and they generally sincerely want you to succeed yeah. you know and and they i'm finding that they're they're definitely sharing wisdom which is really wonderful yeah and a lot of people in the business they're coming from other fields like i used to be a chef right mm -hmm. and being a chef working with knives every day for about anywhere from 12 to 18 hours a day it kind of got me noticing like what really worked on on knives and that is where I put some of my design language in. That's why one of my most popular knives is the kitchen utility folder. Right. And that folder has been around since like 2004, you know, and it's before anybody else did like a, a, a kitchen style folder because most people didn't really think about doing it that way. Oh, they're like, well, knives can already do that. I'm like, yeah, but I want one where the blade is actually dropped down from the handle, like most kitchen knives are. And that's where that started from. That it's like, why don't I make a folder that resembles a kitchen knife? You know? And that's become a very popular market segment. I can think of several makers that have kitchen folders, you know, mm -hmm. and or even even pocket knife designers that are now designing kitchen knives you know, to go yeah. with their, to go with their other knives that they're making because there's a demand for it. So yeah. it's, the yeah. crossover is definitely there. Yeah. And, and the thing is, is that, you know, I think everybody tries to bring something to the forefront and that's just how this market keeps moving forward. Right. You know, whether it is design, whether it's materials, whether it's just the way things fold or mechanisms that lock the blade open, those are all pushing the industry floor forward mm -hmm. and yeah, we, it's all necessary. Yeah. You talked a little bit earlier about prototyping using the, the soft plastic. I wonder, uh, is that still your process now or do you prefer 3d printing? I, I have, uh, I haven't done the plastic cutout for years right. ever since I learned CAD and then eventually learned SOLIDWORKS mm -hmm. and I do it kind of backwards in the sense that I learned CAD first. So I still draw all my 2D drawings in CAD, hmm. in AutoCAD. And then I export a DXF into SOLIDWORKS and I extrude from there. And then everybody's like, why don't you just do the whole thing in SOLIDWORKS? But for some reason, my brain doesn't want to work that way, right? So one day I'm going to get there. But at this moment, I still, do, I still utilize two different programs for this. OK. Yeah. Uh, but you can do the whole thing either in Fusion 360 or SolidWorks. Right. And they both work on CNC machines and, and uh, Mastercam and all those things that run cams. And so you can do all that, you know, on one. But for me, because I have done this for a while now, and I know I always measure the length of my palm and my hand, and I measure the handle. And this is where I kind of get a good gauge of like how it's going to lay in my hand 
and the way I position clips where it doesn't really bite into a, a user's palm. Mm -hmm. Because that was one of my earliest experiences where I'm like, whoa, I'm not going to carry this knife if, it, if this clip bites into my palm. You know, so I, yeah. I, I know that and I'm like, it doesn't matter how beautiful the knife is or how well it's made if no one's going to carry it because it pinches your palm. You know? There's a lot of popular knives out there in the world that if you were to actually stand still and cut for 15 minutes, you wouldn't want the knife anymore because yeah. once you start using it, you realize, man, it's a hot, there's 12 hot spots in this handle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get bruises all over my hand. I can't wear gloves while I'm working. You yeah. know, I just want to cut something. And that's how a lot of people start, you know, um, when they, when they design a knife, the clip is like the last thing they think about. Right. And so it is one of the things that I really focus on because I look at the way things lay out in the handle. And some of it, um, before when I was doing mostly frame locks and, and really all frame locks and liner locks, you know, I wanted the, the clip to be switchable from right to lefty because I do know that there are a lot of lefties out there who, who carry a righty knife, but they might want to carry it in their left hand, you mm -hmm. know? Uh, so, but now, you know, with, with the different locks that, uh, you know, are both ambidextrous, I think we, go, we have to do things that way because we don't want to have like two different types of clip, <laughs> right? So we want it to be ambidextrous so your right hand and the left hand can be comfortable, you know? It seems simple from, a, from a, uh, an uneducated vantage point. It seems simple enough to have a factory make left-handed and right-handed knives. The, the What you might think is, well, just flip the design over, just do it the other way. But in reality, it's I, I, it has to be a lot of extra work to talk yes. them through making it left-handed because well, it's, it, it's, it, it it's, just it's, isn't that simple. It's like, I think it's, it has to do with a like uh, machine time. Yeah. And also, um, I've spoken to knife makers before and they absolutely refuse to build left-handed knives, right? And I'm like, why? You're just cutting out the other way. They're like, no, Liam, your brain has to think like a left-hander and their brain isn't thinking like a left-hander. Well, you have and to, you need all new fixturing. Yeah. Your tool paths are backwards. Like there's lots of things that are different. So it's, it's not as simple as just flipping it over. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think um, I've been very lucky uh, to be able to uh, have some left-handed knives for my mm -hmm. for my customers, and you know, I sometimes I wish I ordered more because at first I was like, let me just order five just to see if anybody will want it, right? And of course, that's the one that sells out first, you know. And then right. everyone keeps asking me like, hey, when are you gonna get more of those lefties in? <laughs> and it's just like, God, kill me now, you know. <laughs> On Facebook, there's an EDC for lefties group. Yes. And I can tell you for sure I'm in that group because I'm left handed. And I can tell you for sure that those guys try very, very hard to support anybody that builds left handed knives because um, they know that it's inconvenient and they know that it's not easy. So when they see somebody's making one, they really go out of their way, which is pretty cool. Yeah. But it's funny for me, like I, I got a right handed field duty and I flipped the clip over. I had thought that I had ordered a lefty, but it, Turns out moving the clip over, I don't, I don't mind at all. It's wonderful. So um, <laughs> it's, I have so many right-handed knives. I'm honestly not used to doing left-handed locks. Sometimes they, they feel different. Yes. And that's the, that's the thing a lot of uh, other knife companies tell me because I told them I built like left-handed knives and they're like, why? And they're like, yeah. well, because the, 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 the lefty, they're like, yeah, but the lefties don't buy the don't lefty knives. They usually buy right-handed knives. So it's just like, what can you do? <laughs> Something my grade school teacher are trying to talk me out of it. Brian Brand <laughs> said that uh, one of his absolute favorite knives he owns is a lefty kitchen utility folder 4.0. Thank you, Brian. So grateful to Leong for doing this. Absolutely. Now, the 4.0 uh, refers to the blade length. Isn't that true? Yes. Yes. I like that you kind of are consistent with your numbering on your knives. Yeah. So that once you know the nomenclature, you can you know it, you can look at it and you know what a knife's gonna be. Yeah. It's pretty nice. And next year, early next year, there will be a 3.5 cuff. Oh, nice. So everybody, you know, they were 
like when when the Cuff three EDC three came out and then the Cuff EDC four came out, you know, people were like, the three is too small for me and the four is too big for me, you know. So I'm like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll do three point five then. How about that? Three and a half is a nice size. It really yeah. is. Like it's sort of a Goldilocks length, somewhere between like two and a quarter and two and or sorry, three and a quarter and three and a half seems yeah. to be just right for almost everyone. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. Like you, we, we start like my personal preference will always be like a four inch knife. Right. And, but yep. I also live in Florida where it's hot all the time. So do I always want like a five ounce knife on me? Not really. Nope. You know? <laughs> but you do need the gator repellent. So yes. Yes. four inch yes. blade, not a bad choice. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask you about um, intended users for your knife. So when I think about certain knife brands, they sort of identify as like a bushcrafting knife or as a survival knife, or some of them are or what you might call like an executive carry or a gentleman's carry. Who right. do you imagine is the 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 ideal user for your products? So the the, the thought behind Leoma Design has always been to build it where it lasts forever. So someone who really treasures this knife can pass it on to their you know, future generation. And so it's for everybody who, like I grew up carrying a pocket knife every day and I grew up in New York City. You know, I went to Catholic school and uh, eventually went to a public high school. And it's like, you know, nobody ever say shit to me about carrying a pocket knife, all right? right. Until right. like the last 10 years we started hearing all this stuff. But, um, uh, but it's like for everybody who carries a knife on a daily basis and just uses the knife for EDC. Now, you're not going to carry a $600 to $1,000 knife backpacking with you. Right. Normally, right. So I would not imagine that line to be in the backpacker where they're digging out their peanut butter, you know, and, and cutting the salami and stuff like that. But can it do it? Yes. And you'll do it in style. Um, but so the, the executives, the people who are who love knives and love a very well-made product and design that speaks to them. And the eutectic line will be for people who actually want to use it as a beater. And so we price it as such and also price it for and, and finishes that you don't mind getting a scratch on it. You don't mind dropping it in dirt or sand or get water on it. Um, but the Leon Online can do all that too. Mm -hmm. But you might feel a little bit bad afterwards if you if you scratched up your knife. But that's what knives are for. <laughs> well, I think you put it well. It's a, it's a, it's a knife you're going to be doing it in style. It's something that you can use your whole life. It's going to last. It's a durable product, but it's also designed for everyday use. Um, but when I think of your product, I think of it as being rather premium also in, in terms of features and, and in look and design. Generally, you don't find a knife as, I don't know, just ergonomically pleasant at low prices. Yeah. Your, your knives are really thoughtful in the way that you design them. The Eutectic line is really interesting. I hadn't seen one until you sent me a couple recently to check out. And for the price, they're, they're an absolute bargain. You get all the you get all the ergonomically pleasant parts of your other knives, but in a really affordable package. Now, what do they street price at? The street price is like retail is eighty five. So I've I've uh, sold them at like seventy five at shows, and yeah, I mean right now we're we're approaching different distributors for them. Who is ringing my doorbell here? Uh oh, hold on a second. Sure. So if you're not familiar, the Eutectic line from Liang Ma is um, it's a G10 handled liner lock knife with, I believe, a three and a half inch blade. It might be even a bit longer than that. Um, they come coated or they can come stonewashed and uh, available in multiple colors and really premium, well-made knife for that budget line. You're going to find that it's um, price competitive with a lot of other mar makers out there in the market. But um, one thing I really liked about your knife, Liang, was the pivot wonderful those things thank just you. fly open so very usable knife thank you so much and that was some guy trying to pitch me on uh, new solar panels that i don't need for my roof so. maybe he needs a knife did you need a knife 
<laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe. I have a design criteria that's important to me with knives. Like, I, I many times in my life, I've been on a ladder working on my house, and I need mm -hmm. to cut something, and I go into my pocket and I pull the knife out. Can I deploy the blade, use the knife, and put it back with one hand, or do I have to let go of the ladder with my other hand in order to open and close the knife? Mm. And to me, that's it's dangerous. And 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 a work site, same thing. Like I don't, I don't, I don't want to have to do that. And I, and sometimes you end up making a lot of cuts. So uh, one example might be like hanging Christmas lights in your home, you know, and you're gonna wire tie or zip tie it up there, and you want to cut off this the remainder. You know, I want a knife that's gonna deploy easily, be put away easily. Unhanded operation is is important to me. And I find that your knives are very, very good at that. They also slide in and out of the pocket well. Can you talk a little bit about the secret magic in your pocket clip? Oh, uh, it's not my secret magic. It's, it's part of the factory secret magic. And we, we go over this time and time again because like pocket pocket clip retention, of course, is one of the topics of, uh, you know, like you want you want the retention. But you don't want it to be a, like you have to like really yank it out. So it's one of these yeah. things that you know. Uh, I'm glad the, the the factory actually do like tests and see like, hey, can this actually go into my pocket and come out without me like having to exert my my full strength on it? And you know, it's it's uh, as we as we are making these these knives, we kind of keep testing it, and every single one of my 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 designs. I carry around with me for, for a couple of months. So I'll receive a sample and then I'll test it. I'll open it, I'll, I'll close it, I'll open it a lot, I'll flip it out, and I will actually use it in my yard. And I'll use it in my in my uh, when I'm taking care of my trees and when I'm taking uh, when I'm cleaning up all the all the foliage and everything and just doing yard work. So right. that's like my basis for how these go. And really, I'm also looking to see like how well the finishes hold up, right? Mm -hmm. Because like that's one of the, the the tests. It's like, okay, am I gonna scratch this blade up, or is this finish gonna hold up over time? And does it is it gonna rust on me? You know, everything rusts. Uh, all metals rust, especially here in Florida. You leave anything outside, it's gonna rust. Right. But anyone that is taking care of their blades, like wiping it down afterwards, or even running it under tap water to flush out the pivot and then letting it dry. That's gonna be fine. Yeah. Then that's you know just to proper maintain your 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 tools and they will last you. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The uh, I was setting you up to talk a little bit about on your pivot on your um, pocket clips. Yes. You generally, you generally put a bearing underneath the clip. Yes. The reason so, I love it so much is it glides in and out with low friction on the pocket, but it's actually very very sturdy in that there's not a lot of flex in the pocket clip so it, it grabs well but the the point of contact is so small it, yeah. it'll end up gliding in and out so the bearings are round and the hole that it sits in is just slightly oblong so the two sides where it contacts the the ball actually hold it that holes in the ball and allows that ball to rotate mm. so it doesn't just sit flat the whole time and allows the ball to rotate as it goes in and out of your pocket. And what I love about that, uh, the ball is, it puts all the pressure on one point, right? So right. it's not this, we, we, I've had clips where it was like a, like a quarter inch length of uh, tit titanium where it contacted. And those didn't work, but it was a longer point of contact. Right. And because of a longer point of contact, that was more drag. This was right. a lot smoother. And there's still people who like it and don't like it. <laughs> but, you know, it is what it is. I spend a lot of time being critical of pocket clips in my mind as I'm using a knife or keeping a knife. And I there are very few knives that I own where I'm unhappy with a pocket clip. Yeah. And it, to me, it can be a deal breaker because ultimately when I'm carrying the knife, I need to be able to trust it. I need to be able to get it in and out of my pocket. And I need to be able to put it away. Um, it needs to not cut into my hand. And with your knives, like you, you've you've managed to nail all of those little points. So, thank for me, you. For me thank personally, you. I think they're great. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. You know, and and sometimes people don't notice because we we look at the knives, but we don't look at how it feels in your hand until we right. actually get it in the hand. Right. Yeah. Can you um, 
think back on all your designs. Do you have a particular design that's your favorite or one that you think um, you're most proud of? You know, there's several. There's several. So I love the way the Warrior 2 looks. Yeah. You know, that that romantic Japanese Tanto grind. Um, that was a knife that I wanted, like, Bob Lum to make, right? And Bob, we, we being friends, he was like, Leon, I don't do flippers, man. You know, he's like, I'm too old to be doing flippers. You know, and this was when flippers was just starting to, to come out. And all my designs were flippers. And he was like, I'm too old for that stuff. Go ask someone else to do it. And he was like, and, and so I asked him, like, so you don't mind me doing that blade? He was like, that blade has been around for like 10,000 years. Right. It's not my so, design. You know, you know, he was like, you know a lot of makers. One of them are going to make you that design, you know, but. Riyadh has been able to nail that design down flawlessly. Yeah. Um, the two that are probably the most well-known are probably the field duty and the cuff. Yeah. And the cuff came first, and it was like my version of like a folding chef knife, right? A folding mm -hmm. kitchen knife. And then I was, and then I looked at the design, and I was like, I like the drop blade, but I also want to add like a like an index finger notch. And that's how the Field Duty was born. The, the really early versions of the Field Duty, the front part of the handle matched the front part of the cuff. Mm. And, and it was only later on I slightly angled them differently enough. And yeah. because of the rotation angle of the, of the Field Duty, I was able to incorporate uh, that wide uh, spear point blade into it, you know? Okay. And that's what really spoke to a lot of people because I always want my blades to be the dominant, not the handles. Like the handles being bigger than the blade doesn't work for me. I want the blades to be bigger than the handles. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So those those three really stand out. And there are a lot of other ones like the Lanny uh, is really popular. And people ask me, like, why did I name this modern design Lanny? when it doesn't look like the traditional lining at all, I'm like, yeah, it's a modern traditional. <laughs> so. Yeah. I, I've, I've only known a couple of Lannies in my life and they were generally the, uh, it's an old man name. Yes. It's a very, it's quite a throwback name. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. I think of the cuff as being very, you like, it's just when, when I first saw that knife, I was like, boy, there's nothing else like this out there. Um, it's very original design. The, uh, yeah, the field duty of course is a, I don't know. It's like, it's all the things that I really like in a knife all distilled down into one knife. Yeah. So, but then I don't know. And I look across the rest of your line, there's little things that I like about each one. So for me, it's hard to pick. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 I do experiments. Like I've done like more modern traditionals, like the Zulu and the Hawk. And um, those were more like, you know, because I, I know not everybody likes like a three and a half to four inch knife. So I did like a much smaller knife. Um, and the the new GSD, which has been very popular, is three and a half inch. Yeah. Um, and then the Tanto one was like my version of, uh, of um, a, a Quiken folder. Mm -hmm. which was like, you know, how many more ways can I do a Tonto? And this was one of the ways that I have never done a Tonto before. So I wanted to put that in there. And then later on this year, there'll be the Warrior 3 coming. And that's an upswept Tonto. Uh, design. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's like, it's like when I look at something like, okay, the, that's like a Tonto, the, the, the Warrior 2 is a little bit upswept but pretty much straight but then the warrior three will be more upswept you know all together yeah well why don't you tell us a little bit about where we can find you in social media of course we're broadcasting this on on youtube we're broadcasting it in your facebook group of course so those folks know where to find you but uh what about your website um my website is leoma.com and of course, Instagram and Facebook, you know, with you guys and uh, Leoma Design Space. 
uh yeah yeah and and feel free to always reach out to me you know looks like you have a sale going on right now 15 yep, percent off for father's day yep it's up until tomorrow that's pretty cool your website's very easy to navigate i like i like the that you have thumbnail pictures of everything if i want to learn more about it i can click in and i can get more Looks like you've Thank got you. some cool, uh, got some cool clip upgrades right now on the main page. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, so people have been asking me for a while now for like different clips, like Mokutai clips, yeah. and finally got the got them in and put them all up. Uh, that is just like one of the easiest way to upgrade uh, your knife. Uh, got the eutectics up, and it's very easy to switch from one the Leoma knives to the eutectic page. And we're going to be adding more the eutectics as time go on. Um, I've received some of the trinities now with black blades too, so that will be going up sh uh, shortly. So you're using 14 C 28 N steel. Yes. So that's a that's a really nice versatile steel. It's easy to sharpen at good edge retention. Yeah. Uh, nice little nice little steel, stainless. Yeah. And, and it keeps a good edge. And and that's one of the things that people like is that stainless keeps a good edge, easy to resharpen. Yeah. And uh we have a really good stock on uh the thinness on, on the stock is like the same thickness as all my other blades, 0.145. So it really glides through everything. You got three-way yeah. opening. You got a flipper tab, you got a window, and then you also have top flipper. Yes. That's pretty cool. Fidget friendly, everybody. Well, that was the thing that I was thinking about with the cuff too, because I realized like a lot of people fidget with their knives when they're at the yep. desk. Or if they're sitting on the couch watching TV, then just playing with their knives. And a flipper is one way, but you know if you can incorporate uh, another way or two other ways, then you know people can just like have a ball playing with their knives. That's right. Yeah. Well, Leon, did I miss anything? Did we leave anything out? No, that was it. I think uh, we covered all the points. Yeah. Okay. I'm glad everybody could join us today. We had some comments come in earlier. I didn't want to interrupt the flow of the conversation, but uh, Jimmy, thanks for watching. Thank you, Jimmy. We got Carl here. Thanks, Carl. Thank you, Carl. Sick Nasty's always tuning in. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, Eric Mason, I believe you met Eric at, uh, at Blade Show. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. Looks like he enjoyed some designs. Yeah, I'm looking forward to Warrior 3. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, Leon, thanks for doing this today. I'm glad we could have a chance to catch up, and uh, I hope this helps everybody get to know a little bit more about you and your designs, and now they know where to get them. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you, Jason, for your time and, you know, always helping me out. I really appreciate this. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for watching. Take care.